morning, everyone. Um, my name, as already been said, as um, David introduced me at the start, is Sarah Jane. And um, I'm not from Lock Bricklin. I'm not even from this, this area. And that's how I'm going to start how I ended up here, because the journey to be here is the start of what God done in, in my life. So God touched me. It was actually in August, the meeting on the 13th of August in 2023, when... Um, I was here and a friend of mine, we had been talking, like everybody else, it had been an unusual few years, we'd all just sort of come out of COVID and we'd been talking about how for us, where we were, we weren't really experiencing that wonder working power, that miracle divine power of God and we weren't hearing about it um, and we were like, if you hear of anything, let's, let's go somewhere and then um, good old social media. Um, David had put up a video about being here in Loch Brooklyn for a divine healing ministry night. So I contacted my friend and I was like, will we go? So the two of us walked up, didn't really know where we were going. Um, we'd never been here. Um, so found it, came along, and we, we didn't know what we were coming to, but we were expectant. Um, because we, we were just desperate, both of us in different ways, to see God. And when we walked in the door we were met with the same response from the people who were here. That expectancy that God is God and he will turn up in his character to do what only he can do. And it was beautifully simplistic, but in just a wonderful way that only God can be. And that's, that's been my experience as I've come back as well. But um, that night David preached on a passage in Luke 13, which was about a woman who was crippled for 18 years by an evil spirit. And um, halfway through his sermon, my friend, she turned to me and said that something significant had happened in her life that exact date um, so many years ago. And she's like, what does that mean? I was like, I haven't got a clue, but God's going to do something. So, like, listen. And actually, had taken my, I'm not going to share what her story, I'm sharing my story, but I had taken my attention off me in a way because I was like, oh my goodness, I can't believe, like, because that was such a specific word for her in her context. But God knew he was doing something different that I didn't know what was happening. And um, David went on and he preached and then at the end he led us all in a prayer and he gave different options of to pray depending on what God was doing um, in you or in that moment through the service. And... I had felt led to ask God a question. So, as I'd said, it had been a crazy few years for everybody, but I had had a, a really particularly crazy few years. And I had come to a place where I was just going through the motions. I was weary. Um, I felt restriction in a way that I'd never experienced before in my life. And I just, it sounds really bizarre, I'm trying to explain this well, but I just didn't feel me. I just felt almost removed from, from life. I was just doing it because that's what you do, and I knew how to do it, but there wasn't much of the passion of me behind all of that. And I was like, God, I can't keep going. I just can't keep going. What is the root of this? And that was the question that I asked. And this incident, incident um, came flashing into my head as I asked that question. And uh, the incident was of a context with someone and they had said, in that, in that whole incident of what was going on, they had said something to me. And the context of what or who doesn't matter, it's the effects that matter. And their words cut me to the core. And as I literally felt like I was reliving that moment, I just seen what those words had done in my life. And I couldn't believe it. I, I, if you'd asked me, it was definitely a God revealing moment because I wouldn't have pinpointed it to that particular incident. So I was like, I know I can't carry this any longer. I just can't. So then when the invitation came at the, after the worship again for prayer ministry, I was like, I need to make sure and have extra help that anything that has been connected to this goes um, because it had, it had hit my character and I'd realised that I was carrying just self-doubt and fear that, you know, no one wants to see me. I'm not worth anything. So if I just go through the motions, keep restricted, then that's, that's a better form and you can just cope and do that. That's not 
oh, what God has. He made us in his image. He made us to be fully who he called us to be in the difference and the quirkiness of all of that. So things like, um, I would have been like, you, you don't want to be in that place. People don't want to see you. I would have found myself apologizing for my presence to people. That's kind of how it outworked itself in my life. So I went for, for prayer ministry and God, God doesn't do just one thing sometimes. He does what he wants to do, not what you... I brought up the incident and um, they, the, the prayer team then, they led me in a prayer of forgiveness, which is, which is understandable. And in that moment, I actually, I dealt with some of the relationship and practical stuff of that incident. But forgiveness is really hard. But forgiving the, the people in that incident wasn't the hard bit for me because I knew that there was just mistakes made. Um, but what I realized was I hadn't forgiven myself for making an agreement with the lies that were spoken over me. And that was the bit that I really needed to break in that moment and they helped me and guided me in prayer in that. And then as that happened, they prayed on, um, I thought we were done. God didn't. Um, and um, the, the guys who were praying for me, they, they stopped and said, do you realize that you're bent over? So I was sitting upright there, their hands on my shoulder, but as they'd been praying, I hadn't realized until they stopped, my, my face was almost sitting on my knees. And they had then connected that to the, the passage that David had shared about that woman being bent over and being crippled. And they said, we feel like there's more that the enemy has maybe got a, an attachment to you in your life. Um, was there anything else that went on at that time? I was like, yeah, quite a bit. Um, and there'd been a six month period where there'd just been lots of very difficult circumstances. But one of the most difficult ones at that time, they'd, they'd asked me, could I pinpoint it to one? And I said, well, actually the, the church that I was a part of at that time, um, there was a lot of just breakdown in the leadership and that just had a ripple effect in lots of different ways. And that impacted me quite significantly. So they asked, could they pray over that and I was like yes and they started they started to pray and they prayed for just different false teachings and um, unhealthy attachments to, to different doctrines or denominations that weren't very healthy to be broken off and I was like everything was just starting to make sense and they asked me what was going on in my body and I was like there's tension in my neck that had been in my shoulders and and it's moved and as they prayed on basically that completely moved and left but I had actually been carrying tension or pain in my my upper shoulders and neck for li literally that whole time those three years was it agonizing no it was a pain that I could manage that I could cope with but I just so because I could manage and cope with it I just thought it was bad posture I thought it was just from, you know, sitting in the seat or reading in bed or, you know, just doing bad habits. But actually I realized that, um, and I know I've heard David talk about this before as well, how actually some of the physical stuff can be a representation of something else. Not always, but sometimes going on. And that was definitely what was true for me. And from then I have not had any of that, that pain or that discomfort. It's completely gone. I don't apologize for myself going into conversations or going into a room. I have a freedom to be myself in a way that I've never had could be. And I was nervous tonight, but I would have been in knots for a whole week because I'm like, I couldn't do this. Why, why would anybody want me up here doing this? Um, but I was just a normal amount of nervous, if that even makes sense. Um, and God has just done so much and I don't know really very many people here tonight I don't know why you're here but there's a verse that just means a lot to me and it's Ecclesiastes 3 and it says yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time he has planted eternity in the human heart but even so people cannot see the whole scope of God's work, work from beginning to end and for me, from that night, I'm not perfect, but I'm a little bit more beautiful than I was before, and God's helped me to see that. I understand a little bit more about eternity than I did before, 
um, and God allowed me to do that. And if you allow him to move tonight, if you, whatever you have, bring it to him. It might not look how you expect. It certainly didn't look how I expected. I thought everything was going to be about my friend that night. Um, and I only thought I was going to deal with one thing when I went up for prayer ministry. But God had, God had a different plan. And boy, am I thankful that he knows better than I do. Um, so no matter what it is, even if it's the smallest pain, I didn't think a pain in my shoulders that I could manage without briefing could be something deeper but God did and he didn't want me to carry it and he doesn't want you to carry things that he didn't put there good evening everyone you know how to test a preacher when they come in the place is empty and then you all start coming in and drips and drabs after eight o'clock but we're glad to see you no matter when you come in it's always good to see folk gathering in and thank you for coming and if this is your first time we're especially glad to see you and we hope and trust that the Lord um, moves, we, we, we believe he will but you experience him uh, moving in your life um, just before I start to, to talk about what the Lord's put in my heart um, the, if the prayer team would make sure you're open to what God might be saying to you for those who are here so if he's given you a word or he might give you you might receive one uh, during what I preach but also David mentioned at the very beginning Hannah and it's interesting because Barb and I as we were driving up the road there uh, to the meeting we don't often do this but I had in the background UCB2 on the radio and Alan Scotland was preaching and he was preaching on Hannah and he was preaching on her desperation and her barrenness and so on so I feel it just sort of quickened me it was a very powerful word that he was preaching but when David shared that um, it just made me think, I wonder if God wanted to touch people in that area tonight. And at Bible College, and this is not a uh, spirit-filled, uh, well, I thank God for Bible College, don't get me wrong, I have to be careful what I say here, but they wouldn't have been teaching us in the things of the Spirit, put it that way, but they always warned us, whatever you do, don't talk about marriage and don't talk about children issues with, with people. And you have to be very, very sensitive around those issues. I really do feel you have to be so careful. And we need to tread carefully and graciously. But at the same time, God does have things to say. And God is able to do wonders. And I've seen him do wonders in these particular areas. Um, and I was reading a week or two ago about how the children of Israel who were in the Old Covenant were going through the wilderness journey uh, and God told them that there would be no barrenness among their ranks and that they, even their, their animals would not be barren and their animals would not miscarry. Now, I'm not putting a stigma on anybody because look at me, goggles here, okay? So none of us is wa wa walking in perfect, absolute health yet. So we're not saying there's something wrong with you if you've got areas and reproductive problems or anything. We're not saying that. All I'm saying is that God is able to do anything and we need to tap into that more. And I'm not guaranteeing what he's going to do for you tonight or what he's going to do for me. But I want you to understand he's able. And the more we come to him with that uh, kind of disposition, the more actually we see him do. So maybe he's speaking to you tonight and you can come and ask for prayer. Sure, what have you got to lose? Come and ask for prayer afterwards and see what God does. So I want you to turn with me to uh, Luke chapter 17. Um, Luke chapter 17, and maybe some of you good Christians would get me a glass of water, and you'll not lose your reward if you do that. You should all be racing towards the door there. One is going anyway. Thank you. Luke chapter 17, uh, verse 11, and I'm going to talk about lessons from lepers. And verse uh, 11 is where we're starting down to verse 19. It's the story of the ten lepers. Jesus healed them. Now it happened as he went, Jesus, to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priests. Thank you, Jeremy, bless you. And so it was, that as they went, they were cleansed. And you need to remember that. If you mark your Bible, that would be a good uh, statement to underline or circle. 
And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way, your faith has made you well. Amen. Thank you to Sarah Jane for that wonderful word of testimony as well. It was a real blessing. Let's all pray together. I want you to pray for yourself now, would you? Before I come to what God, I believe, has laid on my heart. Would you pray for yourself? If you need a touch from God tonight, whether it's mental, emotional, like SJ, or it's physical or spiritual, if you need Jesus, you need to be born again, you need to be restored, you need to be filled with the Spirit, you need to receive something from God, well, come now and ask him in Jesus' name. Father, we come to you. We thank you for everything you've already said tonight. We give you glory. We give you praise. Yours is the honor and the majesty, the power and the dominion. And we exalt you, for you alone are worthy. And Lord, we mean this with all our heart, that we don't want anybody but Jesus to get glory tonight. And so we ask you to come in, in mighty power. And we ask you to show your power, as we sang. Um, show your love and your power, Lord. And glorify your Son, and send the Holy Spirit, and break down our walls, just as we were singing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There were 10 lepers, uh, and I don't know about you, but I find numbers in the Bible rather intriguing. Um, and and I, I know you probably could read too much into them at times, but they are significant. And the fact that there were 10 lepers here, I think, means something. Because 10 in the Bible is a number of completeness, so 7 and 12, but they can mean different things at different times. The idea of 10 is, is a kind of full cycle. Um, it, it speaks of authority, uh, and divine perfection. There are actually ten generations between Adam and Noah before the flood, which is um, interesting. How many commandments are there? Of course, there's ten. There were ten plagues uh, with which God judged the land of Egypt and delivered his people from bondage. The, the tithe is a giving of the tenth uh, of your produce and income to God. And Passover, you may not be aware, was on the tenth day of the first month. And even Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, was after 10 days of repentance by, by the Jews. And we see this number pop up as well in the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus in some of the parables in particular. You remember the parable of the 10 virgins, the parable of the 10 talents, and the parable of the 10 minus. And so we see this pattern where often God is alluding to this idea of completeness, God's order, his authority, his divine uh, perfection. And I think in this particular instance, there's probably allusion to the Ten Commandments, which speaks of the law of God. Because according to Leviticus chapter 13, uh, the law forbid lepers to be in the community of God's people. Indeed, skin diseases of various types cause people to be rejected by the community uh, of faith and there could be hygiene reasons for this uh, we could surmise into that but certainly what God was teaching his Old Testament people was he was holy, we're not but holiness is important so we need a sacrifice to make us holy uh, before him but there are certain things that can make us unclean in his presence and one of those things in the Old Testament context was skin diseases and probably one of the worst was leprosy and this is why we read here in Luke chapter 17, remember Luke was a doctor, he knew a thing or two about this, that the lepers stood afar off. And, and what a depiction of their actual disposition be, before the community of God's people and also before God in his holiness. They were forbidden to come near. In fact, the more we learn, when they contracted this disease and the symptoms become obvious, they had to leave their families and they had to live with one another in colonies at the outskirts of the community. They were outcasts in the truest sense 
of the world. They had to scavenge for food and the rubbish and so forth. And they must tear their clothes, let their hair grow long and unbrushed. And uh, they were to cover the, the lower part of their face like a, like a face mask, basically, and go around shouting, unclean, unclean, in case anyone came near to them and contracted the disease. One form of leprosy attacked the nerves so that the victim could not feel pain. Now, none of us wants to feel pain, but you know, actually sometimes it can be a good thing to feel pain because it can protect you. But sometimes leprosy attacked the nervous system and therefore they didn't feel pain, so they injured themselves, got infections quickly, and then that would lead to degeneration of the tissues. And basically what happened, people's limbs would begin to be deformed and eventually fall off. It's horrific. And so someone who was a leper, and I want you to think about this now, they're effectively experiencing a living death. They're in a body, but their body is degenerating at the extremities, and they're losing limbs. And very often in the scripture, the Holy Spirit uses leprosy as a picture of sin. And what sin does to us, it cuts us off from our families, it cuts us off in our relationships, it makes us unclean, we can infect others, but it also separates us not just from our fellow man and woman, but from God himself. And you could push that analogy even more. But leprosy, and these ten lepers, are a picture of the human condition. And it's interesting to me that the, the lepers all congregated together. They're the outcasts of society, but they're keeping company with each other. No company do they have, in fact, but themselves. Someone said, misery loves company. And it's so true. But the human condition is also depicted here, not just in the leprosy, but it says that Jesus passed, if you look at that first verse 11, passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee, and the actual Greek there is best translated like this. He passed through the middle of or between. And it's actually referring to Jesus traveling along the border between Samaria and Galilee. Now who knows the significance of that? That the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. They used to fight the bit out. The Jews believed that the Samaritans were like a mongrel race. You have to go back into their history to understand this. And there's a whole animosity and a sectarianism between these two people. But now these folks are united in their condition. And Jesus is walking along the border. There is like a wound between the people. That's interesting, isn't it? Jesus is walking along this border. And then he finds a mixture of ten lepers, Jews and Samaritans. But they're united together in their condition. And um, I mean, that's, that's what God's word tells us about all humanity today. So if you're a Catholic, you're a Protestant, you're a Hindu, a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Jew, a Protestant, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, Methodist, Brethren, Baptist, whatever you are, you're welcome here. But there's no difference between anyone here. Romans 3.23 says, For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Which literally means everyone's missed the mark with God. And you could be the best wee prod or Catholic around. But you miss God's mark. you have got this spiritual disease. It's a bit like leprosy called sin. And it's very instructive to me. If you look at verse 13 it says that this mixed group had come together. Wouldn't it be wonderful if people in Ireland came together no matter who they were. And it says this mixed group that came together prayed together. And what did they pray for? Mercy. And they weren't looking down their nose at the other ones because they don't do that right. They, they see that wee thing they do and they believe, believe that's wrong. Which basic, basically interpreted means I'm better than you. So I can't associate with you. And listen, we all do things wrong in all our denominations. And some have got things more wrong than others. So we're not, we're not fudging the truth. But if we all realised the predicament that we've all got, we all need the Lord and we all need mercy and we all need to look to him and start saying, Lord, Master, have mercy as these lepers did. Sectarianism and prejudices didn't matter whenever the Spirit was showing them their need. Oh, to God that, that the Holy Spirit would show Protestants their need. 
but show Catholics their need. But also the Holy Spirit showed them the solution, that's Jesus. And politics and tradition didn't matter in the face of a common enemy. What was it? Leprosy. <laughs> what does it matter? Whether you're Samaritan or Jew, if you're a leper and you've got a death sentence. And so they all shouted, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And look at verse 12 and 13. The end of verse 12, it says... They met him, or just around the start, actually, they lifted up their voice. So it was the human condition that their only hope was Jesus. And so I don't care what your background is here. I don't care you've gone to church your whole life and went to Sunday school, you're baptized, catechized, and I don't care if you've been an atheist all your life or a, a, a witch or a witch doctor. I don't care. Do you know that you need Jesus? Are you seeking Christ as Master and Lord? It's interesting, in Luke chapter 5, verse 5, do you remember Peter was fishing and he couldn't catch anything? And Jesus came and said, cast your net on the other side. And Peter's thinking, this boy's a carpenter. What does he know about fishing? But he said to Jesus, Master, at your word I'll do it. And the word he uses there is chief commander. And that's the same word that these lepers are using for Jesus here. They're saying, chief commander, have mercy on me. And what, he, what they're confessing is, we believe you can command over disease and you can command over death that you've got power. You see, when you realize that, you start seeking Christ. Do you believe that? Are you seeking him tonight? Are you seeking him enthusiastically and earnestly? It says that they, with a loud voice, they were shouting. And you know, we come, oh Lord, if you will, you can do it. But maybe you won't, you probably won't. You know, that's the way we come to God, isn't it? But we need to seek him enthusiastically, believing. Like the woman with the issue of blood pressing into the crowd. And even though she was in Paris, she did all she could to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. Are you earnest and enthusiastic? And are you seeking him prayerfully? Because effectively what they were doing was praying. Praying together, Master, have mercy upon us. Are you praying? You know, we come in here ask somebody to pray for you. Have you prayed for yourself? I know many of you have, and we want to encourage you to seek prayer for, from others. But have you even bothered yourself? Are you seeking the Lord? Because he's the only solution for the human condition. And then we see in verse 14, the Lord's compassion. When he saw them, I think that's beautiful. You see them? This leper colony are far off, but they're approaching near Jesus, and they're crying out enthusiastically in faith. And it says, when he saw them, he had compassion. And I want you to know tonight, and the, the Lord himself wants you to know, that he sees you. He sees exactly where you are this evening, and he has compassion on you. And if you're like a leper, you're an outcast, or you've been rejected, or you're a victim, or you've been mistreated, or you've been ostracized for your, from your family, we could go on and on and on. He sees and he knows and he has compassion. But in verse 14, the great physician gives his prescription to them about what to do for their human condition. Verse 14 says, go show yourselves to the priests. Now you have to understand, this is going back again to Leviticus 13, because according to the law of cleansing of a leper or someone with skin disease, it was only the priests who could verify and, and give them a clean bill of health that they were now well. So they were like the religious doctors of the day. But I want you to see what was the great physician. That's Jesus, the great doctor. What his prescription was for these lepers. Three things at least I see, first of all. One, obedience. Go show yourselves to the priests. You know, sometimes we always have to understand things. In order to do them. But why you ask me to do that? But scripture doesn't really teach us. That we have to understand everything. It just says we, we are to obey. Are you with me? Go your, show yourselves to the priest. Can you think of some of the, the, the strange things. That Jesus asked people to do. You know, he, he rubbed mud on people's eyes. After spitting on the ground. And told them go and wash now. In the pool of Siloam. He, he spat on his fingers and touch somebody's tongue and then stuck his fingers in their ears. And, you know, you're reading this, this Bible because you're familiar with it. You don't maybe set up and think, ooh, that's, that's a bit weird. 
But it is. It is strange. And why did he do it? And we could have all these theologians, oh, it was because of this, that, and the other. And yes, he's using sign language. You know, this man was dumb, he was deaf, and he's communicating what he's going to do to the man. But essentially, he's just being himself and doing what he's guided by God to do. But in all of these situations, there's a common denominator, and that is obedience. Will you do and go and do what God tells you to do, no matter how daft and harebrained it seems to be? Obedience is so important. And there's a man in the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 5, he was a, a commander in the Syrian army. His name was Naaman, and he was a leper. And he heard about this holy man, the Elisha the prophet, who was doing miracles among the people of God, and he decided to go and see him. And it's so rude. Elisha didn't even come out. This man's a dignitary. Elisha didn't even come out to see him. Imagine if I said to some of you tonight, away you go. Uh, go and do this. I'm not even talking to you. That's what he was telling him. He sent the servant out to, to, to speak to him. And he said, go and dip seven times in the Jordan. Now, the Jordan was a stinking river. They, that's the way they saw it. And the Syrians saw it. And he says, are there not clean rivers in my country that I could dip into? Why do you have to send me down to that dirty hole? That's exactly what he's thinking. And then he goes on and he says, I thought the holy man would come out. And he would wave his arms around. And he would do something magical, in inverted commas. And, and the message that came to him was, if, if you'd have been asked to do some great thing, Naaman, would you not have done it? But there's something simple, and it might, it might grate against your mind and, and your heart and sensibilities and tastes. But if God's asking you to do it, just do it. And he went and done it, and his, his skin became like a baby's skin. He was healed. Because he humbled himself just to obey the Lord. Is God telling you to do something tonight and you just won't do it? Well, the great physician's prescription is obedience. Second thing is faith. Jesus said, go show yourselves to the priests. And they went towards the priests even though they weren't healed. Now think about that for a moment. They were walking the road to the priests with leprosy. They still had it. They were not healed. Faith without works is dead. And I emphasize this whenever at the end, and we'll do it again tonight, we get you to pray to God. We get you to speak to the condition in faith. Then we get you to test it. Now, not everything can be tested without medical examinations. And sometimes it takes time to find out whether people have been healed. But one of the reasons we get people to test it where you are is because it's an act of faith and expectancy. Because very often we act in unbelief and we think, I'll get this prayer over as quick as possible and sit down because I'm about to collapse. Or, or I'm afraid to prod that place. Or I'm afraid to think about that area that I had pain in case it's still there. And we're acting sick at times. Now some of us can't help acting sick because we are sick. But you understand what I mean? We're expecting the sickness, we're expecting the pain and in that moment we're not expecting the healing. And so go to the priest, show yourself to the priest. It was obedience, it was faith, but it was also verifiable. Now I want to be absolutely clear to you. I want to run a million miles away from sham and pretense. And there's a lot done in the name of healing today that is a facade. And people are being lied to. Okay? This healing was authentic to the extent that it could be proven. And go to the priest and show yourself was like, you'll get a doctor's letter. You'll have a scan result. You'll have proof that you've been healed. We're not trying to pretend here tonight. And it's not us does the healing anyway. It's God. So the great physician's prescription was obedience, faith, and it was verifiable. But I want you to see the healing's progression. It says, as they went, remember I told you to underline it, verse 14, as they went, the word was spoken by Jesus, but there was a delay. Why was there a delay? Well, it appears that something was incomplete. Something had yet to be done. And you might never know what that thing is in your own life. Let me suggest four, and I do this with the caveat, and I repeat myself, you may never know why. And you may have to wait to heaven or to the resurrection to have that complete healing, okay? But there can be f at least four reasons, perhaps, why the healing is delayed. And this is as-you-go moment for you. One, 
Obedience that we've mentioned. You haven't been obedient to what God has said to you. 1 Samuel 15, 22 says to obey is better than sacrifice. And you can pray and you can fast and you can lay down this for God and you can do this and go here and spend money. But maybe God's telling you to do something and you haven't done it. Or maybe he's telling you to stop doing something and you're still doing it. Secondly, repentance. Now I want to be very careful here not to suggest that you're sick because you're sinning in some way. And that is not what I'm saying. We have to be very careful we don't come across like that. Having said that sometimes sin does come, or sickness does come from, from actual sin. But the Bible does say in James 5, 16, confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. And the inference there is sometimes people do get sick because there's been a sin that they've been engaging in, or, or it's even generational perhaps. So is the delay in healing sometimes because of a lack of repentance? Sometimes. There needs to be obedience, repentance, and forgiveness. In the book of Corinthians, this is New Testament now, we read of these believers in Corinth, and it says, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep, which means die. You've died. And the reason was, many things, they failed to examine themselves and deal with sexual immorality in their ranks, idolatry, some of them were celebrating at pagan festivals, but also litigation. Some of them were suing one another. As Christian believers, they had unforgiveness in their hearts. I suggest if, if you're seeking the, the healing of God, as S.J. alluded to in her testimony, you need to forgive people. Anybody you need to forgive, forgive them. And fourthly, lifestyle. And that's just common sense. Some of you need to stop smoking. Some of you need to stop drinking. Some of you need to do a bit of exercise. Some of you need to get out a bit more. Do what you can do. And when Jesus said, go and show yourself to the priest, there's a sense in which he's asking them to do something that they needed to do in an act of obedience and faith. But they had a part to play. And some of us want God just to zap us, but we won't take responsibility for some of the stuff that's in our own lives. And I'm not, again, let me be absolutely clear, if you have a debilitating condition or anything like that, we know it's not your fault. We're not suggesting that at all. Please clear that away from your mind. But we are saying sometimes there are consequences to ill-advised actions in our life and habits and behaviors. They need address. As they went... Healing's progression. But then there's healing, the healing's manifestation in verse uh, 15. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, one of them saw he was healed. Healing has to manifest sometime. You know, these people walking around saying, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed, and they're clearly not healed. Now, I know there's faith, but don't be telling everybody you're healed if you're not healed. Talk to God about it, certainly. But we're not trying to pretend anything here. It must be manifested at some time, and healing is a real thing. And it's interesting, Jesus healed with a word. He said, go and show yourselves to the priests. He didn't even touch them. And I believe in the laying on of hands. But you don't always have to have somebody lay hands on you and pray for you to be healed. God can do it in the meeting. We've seen him do it in the meeting where no one's laying hands on anybody other than maybe you're laying hands on yourself. Because it's God does it. And it's not ostentatious. You know the way Elisha was saying, oh, I thought the holy man of God would come out and do some kind of a dance and a big fancy performance. And sometimes that's what we're looking. And sometimes that's what the preachers do and the evangelists are doing. Get the music going and the lights dim. And not against, maybe. I read somebody who said, often miracles are the hidings of God's power. Boy, think about that. Often miracles are the hidings of God's power. <laughs> They're so quiet at times. They're so understated. Talking recently at Christmas time about the incarnation, how silently, how silently the Son of God is given. Nobody knew about it, only the shepherds. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is born. Even the conception in the virgin's womb. Who knew about it? No one. Only an angel and a wee girl, a teenager. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. <laughs> I wonder 
did this leper see it first because he was looking for it? That sounds really obvious. But the others were the other nine were healed, weren't they? But how did he see it first? I believe he was looking for it. And we believe by his stripes we are healed. By the cross of Jesus, our sins have been forgiven. He's borne our shame. He's carried our sorrows and our sicknesses and our infirmities. That's why ultimately we'll live in heaven forever and we'll be in resurrected perfect bodies. But I'll tell you, you will see healing quicker in your own experience, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and even physically, if you're looking for it. Healing's manifestation was because I believe this man was looking. And so there's an importance of expectation. What are you looking for? What are you looking for? Sometimes we get ourselves in a disposition where we're looking for failure. We're looking for sickness. We're looking to be disappointed again because we've been conditioned to that way, maybe by the circumstances of life. But there's a mindset has come in. An attitude is important. And this is not spiritual mumbo jumbo. Any good oncologist will tell you that your attitude towards cancer is going to go a long way to, to your success rate. Attitude matters. And we as Christians of all people, we have grace and faith. And this is why this man who saw his healing first, we find out he's the one who gave thanks first. He's the one who gave thanks the loudest. Look at verse 15. So one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God. There was a sense of appreciation. He felt obligated to stop on his way, going to the priest where Jesus directed him, and going back to give thanks to Jesus. He wanted to offer recognition. He was filled with gratitude. He returned and with a loud voice glorified God. And to God be the glory for anyone healed. Anyone saved, anyone delivered in this place. To God alone be the glory. People in Lock Brickland pray. Bless them. And it's good that they do it. And God answers prayer. But it's God answers their prayers. And David Legs tries to preach as faithful as possible. And I try to do my best praying. And, I try to, and I've seen people healed and delivered. But it's not David Legg healing anybody. It's God who does it. To God alone be the glory. And this fellow prostrated himself at the feet of Jesus. A grateful heart, someone said, will give it, will have a tuneful tongue. And it came out of his mouth, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. His grateful heart gave birth to a tuneful tongue. And he sang praises to God. Now I'm not poking fun at anybody or getting at anybody. But you know, one of my bugbears is when I see people with their hands in their pockets and they're just staring down at the great believers now I'm talking about. And the praise is rising and they're just, their mouth isn't even moving. I, I just can't work that out. And I'm not disparaging or belittling what anybody's going through. But if you understand, whoever's forgiven much loves much. Isn't that what, what Jesus said about the woman with the alabaster box? Naaman returned, it says, and gave thanks to the man of God and wanted to bring an offering to him. And you know, there's something about this. There's a mental health epidemic at the moment and has been for many years and even the psychologists are talking about gratitude jars and gratitude journals writing down the things in your life that you should be thankful for because it changes your mindset and can I suggest to you that maybe some of you are more like the nine than the one even those of you who have been saved restored delivered and healed Maybe you've started to even lose the victory that you've had before because you've lost your thankfulness. You've lost your gratitude. And the one that came back, I love it, just the matter of fact way it says at the end of verse 16, and he was a Samaritan. <laughs> the ones who should have been thankful, the Jews, if the nine others were Jews, they weren't thankful. And do you remember the story Jesus had already told in Luke chapter 10 about, uh, you know, uh, the good Samaritan? You know that one? We, we don't understand the, the import and weight of that story. You know, it was abs if you think of the most repellent person in, you, in your mindset of prejudices, and we all have them, the person you would detest the most, even though you wouldn't admit it in church. And they're the one that Jesus makes the hero of the story. I mean, imagine that. That's what he's doing here. But he's trying to emphasize you guys and girls that have been given so much. What have you done with it? 
What are you doing with it? Psalm 107, verse 8, and then it's repeated, verse 15, 21, and 31 says, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of, of men. We are quick to pray and slow to praise. I see this even in our own little fellowship, that when you say, right, let's take some time just to worship the Lord, to praise him and to give thanks and prayers of praise, it's like sometimes pulling teeth. And then... And the prayer is definitely more fluid when we're bringing our needs to God. And it's not wrong to bring our needs to God. But it shows this disparity. The lack of gratitude and thankfulness at times that we ought to show. And instead of going to the priest, the Samaritan became the priest. And he built an altar at the feet of Jesus. And he brought his offerings of praise and worship to the Lord. Sense of appreciation. But I want you to see the exposing questions of Jesus in verse 17. And the first one is, were there not ten cleansed? Were there not ten cleansed? And uh, first of all, I think that shows us the Lord knows who has been healed. They didn't come back to tell him, but he knew they'd been healed. The Lord knows. That there's people who have been healed in these meetings and haven't got back to tell us. And that annoys the life out of me. But... It's just a fact of life. And they'll come back 10 years' time. You know, they'll come and say, oh, I was healed or I was saved. And right, right. You wouldn't think of telling anybody or <laughs> encouraging the preacher that thinks nothing's happening. Or... So the Lord knew those who'd been healed. But then he asked another question. Where are the nine? Did the Lord touch you once? Maybe it's many years now. Where were you once? The Lord asked, where are the nine? Where were you once? Where are you now? And a more sobering question is, where will you be? Remember when the first man sinned the first sin, God came to him and said, Adam, where are you? And the Lord would speak your name tonight and say, where are you? And then finally, and by the way, I had 10 points tonight. Eternal composition, compensation, sorry, eternal compensation in verse 19. And he said to him, to that leper, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Now that's interesting. And if you're inquisitive of scripture, you'll notice there's something going on here. Because how many were healed? Ten. But he says to this one man, Arise and go, for your faith has made you well. And it seems, and all the Bible commentators are in agreement on this, it seems that this man got something extra. The tenth leper got something more because he'd come back and given thanks and gratitude and praise to God. Because the word for well there, your faith has made you well, is the Greek word sozo. And that Greek word means to save. Your faith has saved you. It means to heal. Your faith has healed you. But it also is physical, spiritual, emotional healing. And it means to be delivered, to be set free. Your faith has set you free. It, it means a complete wholeness. Mind, body, soul and spirit that is in the gospel. And the other nine lepers had their bodies made whole. But this one leper that came back in thanks and praise had his heart mended. And he got saved. There was a woman here last month. Came to get prayer for a condition. And she. Got prayer for that condition. But she got born again as well. Before she got prayer for that condition. We heard from SJ. How she came for prayer for a particular thing. This happens regularly. But the, the thing that you think is the thing. Is not the thing. And there's a thing behind the thing. What's the thing behind the thing? In Luke chapter 5 verse 20, it's already been referred to the man who had four friends that lowered him down through probably Peter's roof. And it says there that Jesus forgave his sin before he healed him. But here we see Jesus heals this man before he forgives his sin. There's no textbook for this stuff. God deals with us as individuals. He saves us as individuals. 
He heals us as individuals. He delivers us as individuals according to our needs. Stop trying to copy somebody else's experience. Let God be God in your life and come to him in obedience, in faith, in repentance, in forgiveness. Be prepared to do anything and surrender to him as Lord. It says in Romans chapter 1 verse 21 that because they knew God they did not glorify him as God nor were thankful but became futile in their thoughts. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Now you think about that. Because that generation in Paul's day in the empire of Rome had become unthankful. One of the things. We can talk about all these sexual aberrations that they involved in and idolatries and all types of But what about that one? They became unthankful. Because of that, their foolish hearts were darkened. Someone said, ingratitude is the beginning of all paganism. Ingratitude is the beginning of all heathenism. What does David say in Psalm 103 and verse 2? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. And bless his holy name, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins, who heals all your diseases, who crowns your life with loving kindness. Romans 2 verse 4 says it's the goodness of God that leads us to repent. But you see, if you're not looking for his goodness, you're not grateful. It's interesting to me how many lepers, one out of ten, received the fullness of inheritance, the sozo. That's ten percent. I'm not saying that's a literal figure that we can take, but it's interesting that only 10% received the fullness of inheritance. Who were they? They were the grateful and the thankful. Now, that's a spiritual principle you need to hear tonight and hold on to. I mean, we know in the gospel, Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way to find it. We know that that's the case. Few surrender to Jesus as Lord. There's the broad road of wasting away that we see all around us. But listen, it's more than that. It's even in the Christian life. There's a narrow way to press in to the the fullness of the inheritance of the kingdom of God. And maybe it's even only 10% of Christians that do that. But if you want to do it tonight, the key is thankfulness, gratitude, and obedient faith. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these lessons from the lepers. And we just pray that the Holy Spirit will now, as we trust he has been throughout, quicken the words of God personally to people in the gathering. I need a touch from you. Lord, it's not my job to dish out healings or salvation or deliverance or victory. That's your job, Lord. But we want to be the conduits and the vessels. We want to be the servants of the Lord. And we just surrender ourselves to that incredible, miraculous process and ask you to move. And that there'll be people here tonight that'll be touched by the power of Jesus, you speak the word, and as they go, as they move out in faith and obedience, that you'll verify their healing and do a miracle. In Jesus' name. Is there anyone here tonight, just while heads are still bowed and eyes closed, is there anyone here, and I I did this last uh, month, and nobody responded, but there was somebody saved that night, so this doesn't mean... uh, that nothing's happening in the gathering. I want you to understand, we want to give the opportunity for people to actually step out in faith, even with salvation, because it says we're to confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead and we shall be saved. Confession is very important to own Jesus as Lord before others. Is there anyone here tonight and you want to get saved, you want to be born again, you want to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you want to have your sins forgiven, peace with God, know that you're right with him, just while heads are bowed and eyes closed, would you raise your hand just where you're seated? And you, you can put it up and down, and I'll see it if you leave it up long enough. And uh, we'll pray for you. We're not going to embarrass you or bring you out the front or anything like that. We're not doing those things. 
Is there anyone here? And you just want to say, yeah, I, I want to kneel my college to Mass and say, yeah, Jesus, I'm following you. I, I'm going to be your child and your disciple. Is there anyone? Just raise your hand where you're, you're sitting and I'll see it. And if you want to talk to me afterwards or any of the team, you can if you're still in that place in the balance. Is there anyone who's a backslider and you realize that once um, the Lord did something in your life, but where you are now is not a good place and where you're going and you want to come back to the Lord tonight? Would you raise your hand? Is that you? Is there anyone? Just raise your hand. You can put it down again. Any, we call them backsliders. They've gone cold in faith. There might be none in the, in the, in the meeting. God bless you. Yep, yeah, I see you. Is there anyone else? You need to confess your sin and you need to bring it to the Lord now. You need to confess your sin, bring it to the Lord and ask them to fill that area of weakness, that area of backsliddenness. Anyone like SJ, you just, he's not backslidden as such, but you just feel that you've lost connection with God and life's blah and you just, it's, it's, it's not good and you're not, there's something wrong, you can't put your finger on it and you don't think you're depressed but you know something's not right and, and, and even in the, the light of her testimony tonight you would say, I, I need God to do what, however he wants to do it for me but I need him to help me like he helped Sarah Jane. Would you raise your hand just where you are? That's you. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? You can put it down when, you, when you've raised it. Anyone else? Well, you need to deal with the Lord. Ask him. Sarah Jane didn't sit and do nothing. She came up for prayer afterwards, but she engaged with God as well. Let's all stand together if you can. Raise your feet. We're going to pray, and as we do every... And there's a reason why I do this, and I hope you understand, and I'm sure some of you maybe think, why does he do this all the time? Well, I'm going to explain... It's because I want you to know it's not me that has healing power as such. It's God. He uses men and women, and there are people who carry gifts, that he, but they're God's gifts, but it's him. And you need to know one mediator between God and men. That's Jesus, not David Legg, not any celebrity preacher or anybody on the TV. It's only God, okay? Jesus, God in flesh, that brings us to God. So you can come to him yourself. And if you have a need mentally, emotionally, spiritually, is there anyone on the team... And you have a word of knowledge now that you would give out just before people pray of any condition or anything. We've talked about fertility problems. And is anyone on the team hearing anything, seeing anything? You need to share it now. Don't be sharing it after. Anyone? Okay, that's fine. All right, I want you to pray for your condition. Say, Lord, if you have a mental, emotional, spiritual, physical condition, say, Lord, please heal me. Lord Jesus, please heal me of this, whatever it is. Okay, ask him. Lord Jesus, please heal me of this, whatever it is. And now we speak to the condition. You're not praying now. You're speaking to the condition. You're speaking to your mountain. As we've said before, you're not talking to God about your mountain. You're talking to your mountain about God Say to that thing, I command that to go in Jesus' name. If it's a pain, if it's a condition, if it's a growth, if it's a disease, command it to go in Jesus' name. If there's something not there or not functioning that should be, command it to, to be whole and be right. Okay? And you're commanding that. Now, command it as if you mean it. Remember, these lepers were enthusiastic. We can be enthusiastic. Hi, boy, if I'm watching my team play and they score... I'm enthusiastic. We can be enthusiastic when we're in a political rally. Hmm? Now, I'm going to pray, Lord, I pray that you would do a work here tonight and that you would honor faith and obedience and the preaching of your word. We believe it's by the power of the blood of the Lamb that we sang about and have preached tonight, the cross of Christ. By his wounds we are healed, we are delivered, set free. And I take authority now over every sickness, over illness, over disease, over every ailment and infirmity. And I bind every spirit that is causing those things and I command them to go right now in the name of Jesus. And I pray, Lord, now you'll release the gifts of healings in this place and you'll restore people to health, mind, body, soul and spirit for the glory of Jesus. That man threw himself at Jesus, your feet. 
Lord Jesus and glorify God. And we want to glorify God tonight. Amen. Now, test it out. If you can, some people have to go for scans and tests and, you know, all that kind of stuff. We might never know until a week or a month or a few months. But if you have had a pain in a certain area, why not test it and see if it's any better? Forget about the people around you. Um, test it out. See what you can do. You maybe couldn't do before. Move about a bit. Poke and prod if it's, if it's not embarrassing. And just receive from God. Is anybody aware of a change in their condition, let's say at least an 80% improvement just there now. And you're aware of something has changed and something's better. Is there anyone, would you raise your hand? Is there anyone? Yes, someone, anyone else? Anyone else? All right, we're, going to, we're not letting you away easy. We're going to do this again because sometimes uh, the first time around, Jesus prayed for a man twice. Did you know that? Prayed for a man twice. First time he prayed for him, he saw men like trees walking. He was blurred, he was blind, but he, he saw a blurred vision. And then he, the second time he was completely healed. And we could talk about why that was, but if he can pray twice, I can pray 222 times if necessary because I'm not Jesus. But um, you need to pray for yourself here, okay? And if you have a discernible condition and you're aware of it in your body right now or in your mind right now, you need to take this on in faith, right? So pray now in the name of Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, would you please heal this, whatever it is? Would you please heal whatever it is? In Jesus' name, okay? Don't worry about the music. It's not coming from heaven. Somebody's got their phone on. Okay? Lord Jesus, please heal this. Ask them to heal it. Now command it to go. Take authority if you're a child of God. Take authority in the name of Jesus and command it to go. Command the pain to go. Command the sickness to go. Command whatever it is. If you believe there's a spirit behind it, which there might well be, command that spirit of infirmity or sickness to go in Jesus' name and speak healing over it in the name of Jesus. Speak the healing of Christ. So Lord, we, we in faith lay hold upon you and if there's people who have discernible conditions in the gathering tonight, we pray that you will manifest that healing. Lord, that's what we read in this. He saw that he was healed, the leper. He saw that he was healed and he turned around to God. We want people to know they're healed tonight. In this moment, some will be healed as they go. But Lord, would there be some you could heal right now? Thank you for that one person who's testified healing. But there's more we believe that you want to touch. Do it now, Lord, we pray. We give you thanks. Give you glory in Jesus' name. Now test it out. Test it out. Test it out. Please test it. That's faith. Please test it. Whatever it is, if there's been a pain or discomfort or something wrong and you can test it or you're aware of a shift or a change or you're aware of God's presence on you doing something, maybe it's a heat, maybe it's uh, an awareness, put your hand up if that's you. Put your hand up if that's you, if you're aware of God doing something. God bless you. Amen. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? I believe there's somebody else. I really do. Yes. And there's probably more. There's probably more, but you're checking. Don't be chicken. Give glory to God. The Son of God hang naked on a on a, a wooden cross for you. Don't be ashamed of a work that He's doing in your life. Test it out now in faith. It's as you go. That's the word of the Lord tonight. It's amazing how these words have all matched situations in people's lives. LJ, that woman was bent over for 18 years. Her friend, something had happened on that date. The amount of times I've preached that word from Luke 13, and I've given out, and I said, I don't know if these are words of knowledge or not, but every time I preach this, there's usually somebody 18 years ago or some significant date, and it happens every time almost that I'm aware of. And I'm not engineering, it's God's Holy Spirit speaking, because He sees you. He saw them. He sees you. He knows about your condition. So if He's healed you tonight, give glory to God. I'm going to give you one last chance. Test it, put your hand up if you've noticed any other change. 
And if you're aware of God's Holy Spirit on you right now, it's important that you come to the prayer team and get prayer that, that what God's begun, they help you through and press through in faith. Okay? God bless you.